chapter one of betty baird's golden year this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by holly jensen betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel published in 1909 chapter one coming events cast their shadows before betty was as quiet as a dormouse she had drawn the old chintz covered sofa to the window at the back of the big hall and perched on its edge had not lifted her eyes for an hour from the folio of engraving slanted on the sill gradually however she realized that the ancient scottish castles were growing dim so breathing a sigh of relaxation she clasped her hands behind her head and fell to dreaming about the strange legends she had been reading for a long time betty looked out into the quiet garden a large snowball bush grew near the window and its blossoms were beginning to nod in the freshening breeze you dear little faces said betty suddenly she leaned forward and patted the soft balls in the witching twilight they seemed like shy but curious children peeping in at her through the open window why cousin betty aren't you trying your eyes came a small shocked voice you wise one then betty disentangled from her dreams sat upright and smoothing down her bright rumpled hair was prepared for those polite practicalities which were always uppermost in the mind of nine-year-old edwina the little cousin ran over to betty and throwing herself down by her side snuggled up close to her edwina i have just returned from scotland betty announced gravely tilting the tiny head backwards and kissing both cherry red cheeks did you have a pleasant trip cousin betty asked the child in her most affable make-believe tone such a time breathed betty giving edwina a hug i have found a perfectly fascinating legend in this book all about the bairds and their castle see she went on pointing out the engraving of the baird castle don't you remember that only last week i told you about thomas the rhymer who married the queen of the fairies and went with her to fairyland and that was hundreds and hundreds of years ago you remember the ballad says oh they raid on and farther on and they waded through rivers aboon the knee and they saw neither sun nor moon but they heard the roaring o the sea it was murk murk night and there was nay stern light and they waded through the red blood aboon the knee for ah the blood that's shed on earth rins through the sprigs o that country edwina bounced up and down on the sofa and hugged herself delightedly at the sanguinary description and betty continued he stayed there seven years and learned soothsaying then he came back and lived on the tweed and made a great many prophecies among them this one about the bairds about us the bairds listen betty bent close to the book and read impressively as long as the bairds live in the castle of Achmedin, so long will the eagles inhabit the crags thereof what do you think of that edwina edwina's black eyes gleamed and she gripped betty's hands satisfied that she had fallen into the spirit of the tradition betty continued to read thrice did the eagles flee the castle when it fell into alien hands and thrice did they return to their ancient aries when the name of baird and the blood of the bairds came back at last to their own oh edwina can you guess why those eagles did this edwina shook her head thoughtfully though her eyes did not leave betty's face for an instant the old chronicler doesn't say nor even seem to wonder why pondered betty turning again to the open volume but the letters were now blurred in the twilight what was the bond between the bairds and the eagles can't you see the eagles perched up there on the rocks looking down on those old square towers of the castle and oh betty's sweet voice thrilled with sympathy and her words were unconsciously tinged with the old chronicler's style can't you see them soaring securely round and round the turrets suddenly all is changed their instinct tells them that the race they love has gone from its ancient home do they follow or do they become wanderers too homesick to live without the bairds 
i think they follow the bairds said edwina under her breath so do i just think of their loyalty their despairing leave-taking their joyful homecoming perhaps cousin betty once upon a time a bird saved an eagle's life and that's why they love them good that may be the very reason exclaimed betty and because of that they are the guardians of the family or they may be the transmigrated souls of proud chieftains returned in this form to guard their descendants are you going to buy the castle cousin betty asked edwina with flattering seriousness i'm afraid i haven't yet saved enough in my little iron home missionary bank answered betty she gave edwina's lemon-colored hair ribbon a tweak then bent to one side to see the effect it would certainly be missionary work to buy a home for those poor eagles she added smiling to herself at edwina's rapt face they were silent for a few moments betty thinking of the legend while edwina was enchanted with the long new word she had heard betty use the venerable frisian clock on the wall with an abrupt falling of its heavy brass weight struck six six betty's voice showed her surprise cousin betty what was that word you used something about graded edwina spoke hesitatingly torn between her love for a sounding word and her fear of the customary bantering my polysyllabic cousin that word was trans my gray tid syllabicated betty laughingly squeezing edwina's hand at each hyphen but what does trans my gray tid mean persisted edwina you don't mean to tell me that a big girl like you doesn't know what a little word like transmigrated means teased betty why it isn't more than half as long as you are yourself please please cousin betty it sounds like that word about birds going south in the fall that's a fine beginning but run to the dictionary child i don't believe you know yourself pouted edwina while betty took this opportunity to close her book and hummed cheerfully the opening bars of annie laurie edwina soon caught her hand and interrupted in a whisper because a whisper seemed more polite when interrupting i forgot to tell you that dinner would be ready exactly at six instead of half past oh then we must migrate to the dining room at once cried betty springing up i'll help you look up that word this very evening it's lucky this old clock's fast singing and laughing stumbling too because they would not look where they were walking simply out of the irrationality of pure high spirits they reached the dining room and opened the door suddenly dazzled by their plunge into the brilliant light after the darkness of the hall they covered up their eyes and clutched each other frantically as they ran against some object on their heedless way oh how dear it is betty exclaimed opening her eyes and taking in with a swift glance the fine damask the thin silver the fragile white and gold china all handed down in her mother's family end of chapter one recording by holly jensen chapter two of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter two many a true word spoken in jest are we late mother mine asked betty as mrs baird came into the dining room sorting a handful of yellow flowers for the table no child run up to the study and call your father before he's too much absorbed in his writing we are having dinner early so that he can attend a meeting at the manse now edwina dear set the chairs around the table betty flew up the stairs and soon reappeared with her father they walked arm in arm down the spacious staircase into the room a bit of dinner ceremony that the dignified clergyman always expected of his impulsive daughter after the soup mrs baird said since we are pressed for time betty you and edwina may help to bring in the dinner come edwina bound as to the tabor's sound betty cried and she whisked the child into the kitchen almost upsetting jovial old katie the ancient cook who seemed to have been handed down with the family silver from mrs baird's home so many years had she and her mother served there 
you two chillin do beat the band she protested grinning broadly then with a silver meat platter heaped with fried chicken held up firmly in both hands she shuffled in she nodded her red and yellow turbaned head approvingly with a self-satisfied smile as she glanced down at the savory dish on her way to the kitchen she halted at the door to catch the doctor's look of approval she had scarcely disappeared when betty bearing imitatively a glass dish of quivering cranberry jelly and another with a creamy cone of mashed potatoes and edwina with a platter of crisp brown corn pone came in and flanked the meat plate with their burdens the mimic serving was so true to the model that mrs baird laughingly asked betty if she was never going to grow up yet as she looked into the frank beautiful eyes that held the warmth and joy of springtime her longing to keep her a child belied her present chiding never i fear carissima acquiesced betty cheerfully i don't feel any more equal now to being eighteen than i did at fourteen immediately after grace during which it must be confessed her large black eyes peeped hungrily at the chicken edwina piped up pointing to a bowl of daffodils in the centre of the table dotty brought those flowers over uncle william dotty is very kind the doctor said halting his fork in mid-air as he looked carefully at the flowers i think the ellsworths always have the finest of everything in their garden craig's scientific gardening is paying him at last said betty with pride in her boy friend's achievements he's been helping me on saturdays when home from columbia and next year we'll have all the early earthy things we need right out of our own kitchen garden aunt helen you don't know what cousin betty is going to do now exulted edwina with knowing eyes and a demure smile mrs baird smilingly shook her head wait until dessert little edwina she suggested then we shall have more time i can hardly believe it is another venture everybody laughed betty most of all nevertheless down in their hearts her parents appreciated very tenderly what betty was trying to do it was simply the old story dr baird after twenty-five years in the ministry had bought this small farm on long island to be near his work as one of the assistant secretaries of the home mission board the heavy mortgage on it was held by a man who constantly threatened foreclosure if the interest was not paid on the very day it was due these conditions had thrust upon betty the problem of fitting herself to put her shoulder to the wheel as a son might do and help her father to lift the mortgage she had no thought of a career dr baird belonged to the old school and it was painful to him to think of his daughter starting out as a breadwinner yet his increasing ill health and the inevitable superannuation were constantly before him and it seemed wiser to allow betty while still young to attempt to make herself independent in the beginning her modest ventures had it is true failed one after another but finally a way was opened after a series of experiences the most trying of which was her deposal by the rich mr webby from the village librarianship to make room for one of his distant relatives betty had found her niche in miss minturn's studio of design in new york this position had been offered to her through the good offices of her old schoolmate mary livingstone who was a senior at the pines when betty was a worshipping freshman there mary had married a mr king and was now living on their large estate on the outskirts of hobart not far from betty's home miss minturn was a woman of wealth and wide social influence and withal an original character who had determined to abandon dinners and receptions and to have a life work as her brothers had being indefatigable herself her nervous energy kept everybody around her in a whirlwind of activity yet her nature was so generous and inspiring that hard work in her company proved a delight betty found interior decoration thoroughly congenial not only was she fitted for it by rare judgment and discriminating taste but also during her three years at the pines she had been thrown much into the company of one of the teachers miss green whose hobby was decoration 
from her betty fortunately as it turned out received a fairly comprehensive course in the art before she took up its detailed study she thus began without that fumbling that comes from undertaking a work for which nature has not cut one out she did not go against the grain betty's friends thought that since one client had accepted her plans for decorating a library with it is true miss minturne's advice and supervision all would be plain sailing but those who knew saw that it was only the start in the long toilsome race for success there would not be a dosworth memorial library every week or month no week after week and month after month of studying designing planning and writing out specifications for miss minturne had to come in with that deadly monotony of routine that characterizes all pursuits and take all her time and thought before she received another commission fortunately her mind burnished with its own youth the long days the inevitable disappointments the prosaic details she steadily refused to dwell on the dark side of her experiences and gaily diffused her own hopeful views and created an atmosphere of cheerfulness for herself and others dangerously near a grumble was a favorite expression of betty's when she found herself lingering on the failures then she would brush aside the subject and begin a merry story she realized that the will to be cheerful and to make others cheerful grows with its exercise in just such apparent trifles as depressing or hopeful conversation presently katie brought in the dessert ice cream moulded in the shape of a swan the swan design was edwina's special delight please i want the head aunt helen she whispered confidentially the dismemberment began and mrs baird turned to betty now betty let us hear about edwina's secret she has a big bee in her bonnet this time aunt helen said edwina importantly her eyes dancing with excitement she delighted in betty's air castles and here was a real one in scotland no wise one not a bee but an eagle in my scotch bonnet replied betty with a great show of haughtiness and an elegant flourish of her dessert spoon what does all this mean elizabeth asked her father looking questioningly from one to the other i've been studying that splendid book of engravings mr anstice gave me at christmas it's all about scottish castles and oh father there's a baird castle shown in it and an enchanting legend about eagles that live in the crags near it only while the bairds remain the owners of the castle then betty told about true thomas's prophecy they certainly are very particular eagles evidently they know when the society is good laughed mrs baird the castle is for sale now betty went on with increasing animation how i wish we could buy it i don't believe it would cost much for it is small and tumble down and anyhow castles in scotland are as common as thistles bluebells and heather she wound up merrily i should like very much to see the castle said mrs baird her fine motherly face showing her sympathy with betty's enthusiasm it's a charming prophecy far more attractive than those commonly associated with old houses it makes me think of st francis of assisi and his saying my brother the bird you've heard something about the baird eagles haven't you father asked betty turning hopefully to him i have given very little thought to genealogy and i do not know much about my family though i do remember hearing my grandmother say that seven tall baird brothers came from scotland two centuries or more ago and settled in different parts of this country oh father do remember more she pleaded squeezing the hand with which he drummed thoughtfully on the table i'd love to be related to that prophecy and to sir walter you know the rhymer's glen is at abbotsford i've just been reading in lockhart's life of sir walter which you made me begin that he took an especial interest in families that had romantic legends connected with their name or house he'd love this eagle prophecy why of course he knew it he must have betty's mobile winsome face showed the varying expressions of hero worship of love of legendary romance and clinging to her girlish dreams she leaned forward 
her light curling hair touching her father's iron-gray head her dark eyes searching his thin scholarly face with the feeling that she just had to make him remember his family's scottish home i regret for your sake my child that i have not taken more interest in my pedigree now your mother could tell you all about the bairds if she were in my place he wound up smiling quizzically across the table at his wife yes i could averred mrs baird smiling back her appreciation of a perennial family joke you know they say shintoism is ancestor worship well then my shinto shrine is that big olive wood box there on the mantelpiece with my family's history that's the very first thing i'll grab if this house catches fire said betty enjoying her mother's joke are you sure you wouldn't take the picture of your scottish castle instead your mother's ancestors lived in mere houses not castles said her father slyly betty chuckled at the hit but defended herself spiritedly really father there's no snobbery in wanting this little tiny romantic thing in my life it makes well even commuting pleasanter to have this to think about it's only i don't know what but i'd give a fortune do you mean your pickles your marmalade your betty's slim right hand stopped edwina's pretty pert mouth to think of a genuine grinling gibbons cherub talking like that she lamented though dimples persisted in coming to her cheeks to keep company with the mischievous twinkle in her bonny eyes edwina indignantly jerked her head to one side why not go over there and try your name on those eagles said her father jestingly that would be a test as to whether or not you are the right brand of baird now father you know what i mean it would be living poetry to go over there and see that castle buy it hear the eagles scream know they knew us see their nests the heather the plaids hear the hurdy-gurdy you can hear the hurdy-gurdy almost any day in new york laughed her father betty joined in the laugh she could always enjoy a joke even at her own expense then he continued we shall find it rather difficult to live poetry in this age however i do believe in an avocation even a hobby to lighten our vocation and since you are interested in this legend elizabeth i will try to recall more about my people's history in our old homestead in pennsylvania there were bald eagles in plenty among the rocks of the alleghanies and it was a neighborhood saying that they came there when the bairds did though what gave rise to the idea i cannot say betty almost jumped from her chair there i felt it in my very bones that we were the eagle bairds her eyes sparkled at this confirmation of her hopes perhaps there are no bald eagles in scotland suggested mrs baird smiling at betty's enthusiasm i remember the eagles very distinctly resumed the doctor now warmed up to the idea as he looked into the depths of his cup my grandmother and later my mother were in the greatest terror lest the eagles should carry off the little children some day betty i want to take you to my old home though i fear there will be nothing left as it was except the old mountain and the trout brook the doctor lost himself in pleasant memories how long has it been since you were in your old home father asked betty her tender heart and quick imagination touched by the longing in her father's voice it was this warm sympathy that made betty seem every one's contemporary i was your age elizabeth when i left there and every year i've planned to go back on a visit that is of late years why couldn't we go in your vacation in august suggested betty buoyantly dr baird looked up quickly and his brown eyes lost their meditative look and brightened like his daughter's as if he too liked to live poetry why we could do that he admitted betty clapped her hands good we'll camp out and be as wild as indians and maybe she laughed we'll find our own true eagles by the way said mrs baird after expressing her gratification over this summer plan didn't lois write that her father was going to scotland this summer perhaps he will find out something about your eagles oh he would isn't it too good to be true that lois is coming so soon 
dear lois it's a long time since we've seen her said mrs baird smiling tenderly at the thought of the young girl little did i think said betty playing absently with her tiny coffee spoon when i was so homesick at the pines and every girl in the school seemed to hate me and lois bird came as my roommate that for five years we should be like sisters we old people are falling into reminiscences laughed dr baird moving his chair so he could cross his knees and turning to look out into the garden where a new moon was making a faint glimmer through the lombardy pines do i belong to the bairds asked edwina suddenly she had not spoken for some time having evidently retired from the conversation to ponder the part she held in this prophecy of course you do edwina baird innes then if if edwina paused for a moment betty saw by the determined gleam in her eye that she had found an opportunity to air an addition to her famous vocabulary and proceeded to egg her on yes edwina you were about to make a remark she encouraged her turning to her with elaborate courtesy if propinquity edwina sighed softly as the word came slowly from her strained lips would do we might build a house near the eagle's rocks if the castle costs too much for us to buy that sounds like a very practical idea said dr baird smiling as he patted edwina's small dark head and pushed his chair back from the table that won't do edwina dear protested betty her eyes twinkling with fun you can't cajole eagles with propinquity it says as long as the bairds live in the castle not near it cousin betty will surely go over and become a transmigrated eagle herself giggled edwina in revenge betty gave a little shriek which was covered by the sound of their chairs as they rose from the table to go to the side porch where it was their evening custom to stand a while and look out at the night who knows said mrs baird cheerily as she took betty's hand and placed it in her arm while edwina hung to betty's arm with both hands who knows but that the eagles may come here when they leave their old home if we are of the true fold well said betty laughing it would be a pretty long flight even for the baird eagles but i shall be on the lookout from this time forward henceforth and forever my fate is linked with theirs many a true word is spoken in jest returned her mother pleasantly but i am afraid i can't see how you and your eagles are ever going to become acquainted End of chapter two recording by holly jensen chapter three of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter three the picnic on paulding's point lois is really here was betty's first thought that morning the second how shall we celebrate she pulled aside the curtain the breeze that came in was mild and filled with the odors of early spring the sun was shining brightly on the bay a row is the thing so after a brisk discussion the girls decided to mark this red-letter day by rowing down to the inlet they flew out to the boathouse right after breakfast then down to the boat laden with oars cushions oarlocks wooden scoop sponge and a basket of luncheon the boat which had been put into the water only the day before had leaked a good deal but they went energetically to work with scoop and sponge and soon had it dry as a bone lois dropped into her old seat in the stern and betty standing up with an oar in her hand pushed away from the little wharf then she sat down and adjusting the oars in the locks began to pull towards the inlet rowing easily in time with their talk for they had many months of separation to bridge over both girls were tall slender and graceful but there the resemblance stopped lois had dark hair and a clear olive skin while betty's light brown hair glinted like gold in the sun and her cheeks were as delicately tinted as a rose leaf they were unlike too in more than looks betty 
buoyant humorous high-spirited her feet steadily refusing to cross a bridge until they came to it was always seeing the bright side of life lois while usually light-hearted was serious and inclined to be apprehensive both were loyal and true betty's work was soon the topic of their conversation miss minturn is not herself said betty thoughtfully as she gently feathered her oars miss minturn what can be the matter is she ill asked lois anxiously no isn't she the same to you is she aren't you don't you give lois stumbled along then ended helplessly betty rested on her oars with the dripping blades poised in the air and laughed gaily at her friend's anxiety you dear old mentor guide and friend she mocked bending to her oars and making the boat spin through the water call me what you please mentor or meddler but it would be dreadful if you didn't give it would be dreadful but it isn't if you will beat about the bush i assure you that i do give perfect satisfaction to my employer betty you are so hopeful said lois plaintively there it goes i wonder why so many people say that to me with such disapproval why is it betty demanded looking a trifle nettled well said lois half laughing i suppose it seems wiser to apprehensive people to be on the lookout for trouble and optimistic people strike them as as shiftless but i am frightened bet persisted lois you had so much trouble with your ventures until you found your present place then everything seemed so pleasant everything is pleasant why lois miss minturn and i just love each other and we agree perfectly in our work answered betty in a tone that carried conviction you darling old betty i might have known better but how is she different you are dreadfully unsatisfactory it's downright hard to say even to you lois that a woman i love and admire is well yes snappy at times snappy that's strange she's always been so agreeable even if she is a little eccentric excuse me for saying it why miss minturn is only beautifully original not eccentric but lately she has been treating even mr anstice terribly queer i thought she and mr anstice were such great friends they always have been replied betty letting the boat drift and sinking her chin into her two palms i can't understand it lately she's been acting as if he were her worst enemy lois looked at betty as though trying to read in her eyes a solution of the problem that interested them both deeply for miss minturn filled a large place in their hearts then a light broke over her face why betty she exclaimed i have it she's in love with mr anstice in love miss minturn mr anstice what a crescendo of surprise he's been in love with her for a long time you know that now she's either in love with him or she's not in love with him if she's in love with him betty clapped her hands over her ears and shook her head laughing lois you make me dizzy with your logic and your in loves but how would that explain her being snappy snappiness is one of the surest signs of love lois declared with immense sophistication betty again dropped her chin into the palms of her hands and stared outward towards the horizon while lois fell into an abstraction that seemed to hold disquietude it's certainly a great undertaking for a woman of her age at last said lois sagely leaning forward and sponging up some water that had leaked into the boat yes we young things could manage so much better teased betty resuming her oars i mean that she's happy now lois explained and they have entirely different temperaments and it seems to me it would be better to let well enough alone miss minturn is talking of taking a trip soon i do believe that she's running away from herself maybe she is in love with him but she's not satisfied said betty eagerly now wholly in sympathy with lois's surmise she finds herself weighing things practically and that disappoints her 
he's wild over her and that pleases her and she wants to be wild over him oh the o oh was thrown up like a breakwater to stop the impetuous flow of her words lois it's wretched taste to be discussing this she finished yes especially when it's all guesswork yet i wish it wasn't such fun to discuss people and their affairs broke in betty smiling ruefully in her turn she now began to bail out the water which was taking advantage of their inattention straightening up her face flushed from the exertion betty waved the red wooden scoop enthusiastically around isn't it good lois aren't you glad to be back couldn't be gladder betty answered lois she glanced furtively at betty's bright sweet face as the fair head bobbed up and down while she mopped the bottom of the boat with the sponge she knew betty would read her thoughts if she looked her full in the face and lois's thoughts were not happy with miss minturn married what would become of the studio of design and of betty now lois i'm going to give you a correct imitation of a race against the world's record in four minutes twenty-seven and two-fifth seconds i'll land you at the old lighthouse on paulding's point ever since we've lived here we've been wanting to see that old lighthouse and now is our chance steer straight for it settling herself on the thwart getting her feet well braced against the stretcher and taking a fresh grip on her oars betty bent to her work and made the boat cut through the water at a rate that would have done credit to a boy of her age the bow soon grated on the sandy beach of the point and the girl scrambled out betty dragging the light grapnel anchor some distance from the water while lois took the cushions and luncheon walking briskly towards the tiny white cottage at the foot of the towering granite lighthouse betty rapped timidly on the door saying in an aside to lois i wonder if they'll object to visitors the door was opened by an elderly gray-haired yet vigorous-looking woman who surveyed them sharply please excuse us said betty but would it be possible for us to see the lighthouse the woman glanced from one to the other then without answering turned and went into a rear room carl they heard her call out evidently to someone upstairs a couple of gals want to see the light heavy steps at once began to pound down the stairs and presently carl appeared a tall robust fellow with the appearance and manner of a seafaring man this way was all he said and led them to the light tower entering through a heavy oak door they followed their guide up the narrow winding stone stairs lit here and there by slits of windows in the wall in the little room at the top of the tower they found an old white-bearded taciturn-looking man dad these young women want to see the light carl announced and disappeared hastily the father greeted them with a kindly though absent-minded glance and proceeded to explain with much pride the workings of the light the composition of the lenses the steam siren for foggy weather the handbell kept in reserve in case the siren should get out of order and related many interesting incidents of his thirty years service there delighted with what they had seen and heard the girls thanked the keeper heartily and made their way down the stairs and back towards the boat lois was some distance in advance as betty had stopped to examine a boating party that was rowing a little way out from the shore betty oh betty she heard lois wail and seeing her look of alarm she flew to the boat at which lois was pointing in dismay why why betty could get no farther but dropped down on the sand and laughed until the tears rolled down her cheeks their boat which had not been in the water long enough to close the cracks opened by the winter had filled with water to within a few inches of the gunwales and oars and scoop and sponge were floating around in it with the greatest abandon lois we're marooned said betty cheerfully we can hardly ask the lighthouse people to help us can we debated lois son carl could help us i'm sure he'd love to play knight errant to a couple of gals just think lois after all we've read about knights we must be rescued by carl 
carl the keeper of the light carl the hardy salt sea knight one man alone began lois that's true interrupted betty only one knight too bad lois could not resist the contagion of betty's light spirits and she too soon took a humorous view of their situation and of course lois betty pursued even one man would have no trouble at all in emptying our boat then too i know the kings pass this point every day and jack has his launch in commission now and it's likely he'll come by water instead of in his car on his way to see you he can tow our boat dunny is pretty sure to be with him or betty jumped up snatched a cushion and tore down to the water's edge what are you going to do lois cried and flew after her wigwag she called back as she waved the cushion madly at a passing launch but its occupants paid no attention i thought it was the morton's boat said betty as she stepped hastily back out of reach of the waves from the launch which began to break on the yellow sand instead of getting out their dainty luncheon they sat down and dabbled aimlessly with the sand and tried to talk but their eyes turned continually toward the inlet all at once betty sprang to her feet and began to wave her pillow frantically while lois fluttered her veil in one hand and her handkerchief in the other both calling out jack jack the water witch ahoy this time their signals were noticed for jack appeared on the deck and swung his cap swiftly in great semicircles hello betty what's up glad to see you lois be there in a jiffy he turned and gave a command to his helmsman and the launch swung in a sharp curve towards the point it came to anchor a short distance off shore and jack was rowed ashore in the dinghy dunny must be with the kings said betty in an undertone he won't wait a minute to come to see you lois jack stood up in the stern and saluted the girls gallantly welcome home lois he called lois returned his welcome cordially and said to betty in a whisper he's handsomer than ever perfectly stunning yes the same old jack always in a good humor with himself and everybody else and it's just splendid that he stands so high in his class at harvard shall we go to his commencement or to dunny's at yale betty asked glancing slyly at lois oh both of course parried lois with a tidying jerk at her necktie which hung from the wide collar of her dark blue sailor suit betty ran down to the boat hello betty hello lois tickled to death to see you cried jack as he stepped ashore and seized both of lois's hands in his vigorous grasp but what has happened to your boat he asked in surprise betty explained and jack directed his man to bail it out in a short time the boat was fixed up ship shape in bristol fashion according to jack let's have some luncheon proposed betty up there on the hill is a table made of a board fastened to two tree stumps we can eat and watch for the kings at the same time dunny's with them said jack taking the basket and scrambling up to the table the girls followed with the cushions they had just spread out the napkins and placed the sandwiches cheese olives and chocolate cake on plates when jack abruptly dropped the basket made a megaphone of his hands to hail a passing boat then rushed down to the shore it's the king's launch dunny's there in the bow and they've spied us cried betty as they ran breathlessly down the hill after jack after the first friendly confusion of welcoming lois back for though mrs king was several years older than the two friends she had a warm affection for them both and lois was the first girl to attract big generous straightforward dunny lane the idea of a picnic was developed and mrs king sent to the launch for a hamper of provisions including a large thick juicy beefsteak the boys made a fireplace with stones and built a clear sparkling fire of driftwood at which betty broiled the steak brave betty baird applauded king who was devoting himself assiduously to the task of encouraging all around him to work jack more kindling the fire's going down betty called in a quick tone 
a perfect cross patch like all cooks grumbled jack as he shuffled off with a sly wink at dunny i'm the only soul here earning his beefsteak with the sweat of his brow he growled as he carefully mopped his forehead on which there was not a sign of perspiration but before i'd be such a miss nancy as him pointing to where lois was teaching dunny to set the table mary king lamented loudly that her incorrigible husband would do nothing but hang over a clear cold spring which he insisted he had discovered though a barrel had been sunk deep around it long before and a tin cup hung hospitably on a nail in the barrel take this a minute jack but mind your p's and q's betty thrust the broiler into his hands and skipped off to get butter salt and pepper in a second every one was rushing madly from all quarters towards the fire for a distressing odor of burnt meat met them half starved as they declared themselves betty snatched the sizzling toaster from jack's limp hand while all chaffed him unmercifully for his lack of skill another alfred the great he moaned melodramatically and he threw himself down on a log and hid his face in his hands betty scraped the cinders off the meat which was none the worse for its fiery bath and escorted by jack carried it to the table everybody fall too cried king heartily setting the example ply a good knife and fork urged jack in a muffled tone that showed he was not shirking his own part to the accompaniment of merry chatter and much airy persiflage as king called it the last scrap disappeared then king rose jack old man your health you're certainly a great hand at rescuing girls from perilous positions he held aloft his battered tin cup with the cold spring water sweating it here's to jack brooks the life-saving hero may he soon wear his carnegie medal he cried all sprang to their feet and raised their cups on high may his shadow never grow less said dunny pounding him affectionately on the shoulder blades betty and lois laid their hands on their hearts and made profound bows saying their gratitude was too deep for words delighted with the good fun of this unexpected picnic the little party voted to have another at the inlet very soon as they discussed it however the plan gradually gave way to another proposed by betty a may party at the baird's home to welcome lois you're not supposed to hear anything about this lois said dunny let's get out of the way bless you my children go jack waved them off with uplifted hands the plans for the may party were made it was understood subject to mrs baird's approval you can bank on mrs baird every time when it comes to welcoming lois and providing fun for kids commented jack betty and mrs king decided first that lois should be chosen queen of the may and that betty should train edwina and her set as the child called her group of little girl friends to sing an old may day carol that was sung in the time of queen elizabeth and to dance a maypole dance about this time jack and dunny remarked that they wanted a grand hurrah for lois that maypoles and elizabethan carols were all right but as for them they wanted some athletics even if they had to be elizabethan athletics to this the girls agreed so the boys decided on archery and bowling on the green for the young people croquet for the elderlies and battledore and shuttlecock for the youngsters and refreshments said they for all and plenty of em boys are never happy without something to eat laughed mrs king and girls of course never eat do they retorted jack a dance in the big hundred-year-old barn was settled on for the evening and that seemed to suit all whom shall we invite asked mrs king everybody answered betty sweepingly the usually exclusive mrs king looked at her curiously for a minute then smiled as she patted her hand affectionately you dear old betty she said softly yes everybody as you say let's have everybody the list was made up on the spot king fished around in his pockets for a while and finally drew out a piece of paper and the stub of a lead pencil and wrote down the names 
the picnic party broke up early in the afternoon betty and lois going home in the king's launch with the leaky rowboat trailing ignominiously behind end of chapter three recording by holly jensen chapter four of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter four the commonplace book as the four young people passed through the gate into the garden betty spied her old commonplace book on the bench under the cedar betty's nook in the corner as it was called indeed every seat tree bush or rock in boxwood seemed to be named after some one lois's throne was the quaint old horse block beside the gate under the twin fir trees edwina's rock held a commanding place on the left terrace and nothing delighted her more than to sit on its rounding top and sing in her throaty way evidently imagining herself a great prima donna with the world at her feet i've looked through my desk time and again for this cried betty picking up the commonplace book and dropping it into her lap as she sat down jack please give me one of your good lead pencils she added holding up her hand lois i am going to write out that prophecy about the baird castle when betty looks as demure and humble as that and speaks out her words so that you can actually see em in italics you may be sure she's exploding with pride laughed jack handing her his pencil with its well-sharpened point ah cruel world murmured betty trying hard to look aggrieved she opened her book and with a pensive air began to write down the prophecy while lois related the tradition to jack and dunny why betty actually believes that about the eagles exclaimed jack believe it betty elevated her fine straight nose in affected surprise of course i believe it oh you americans are so practical now we scotch are more mystical she turned with a superior air to her book ah i see your friend webby is pure unadulterated scotch too i believe drawled jack significantly as he sat down on the seat beside her betty appeared too absorbed to notice while lois and dunmore wandered off and sat down on lois's throne they had much to talk over for dunny was about to graduate from yale and lois had been travelling abroad during the winter months with her father now betty what in the world is the use of that thing asked jack pointing a slighting finger at the worn marbled cover of the commonplace book you can't possibly remember many of the quotations so they can't help you much betty gazed thoughtfully at it making little dots on the page with her pencil i love the book jack my father gave it to me when i was a youngster and started me to copying good things into it and memorizing them so that i do know nearly all of them really jack the contents of betty's commonplace book showed that her ideals had changed that her mind was opening to deeper thoughts and her spirit striving for a fuller and more permanent sway there were fewer and fewer merely graceful poems and selections and more that related to moods and character as if her year in the workaday world had shown her the necessity of what might be called formal character building in the words of one of her last entries a genuine longing for the grace of a cheerful heart an even temper sweetness gentleness and brightness might be read between the lines of her later quotations well jack she said presently with a lingering look at the book i am not so sure and yet but here's my latest he had a nature as large as the whole world yet there was not room enough for the memory of a wrong if everyone was that way wouldn't this be a delightful world to live in oh i don't know about that considered jack doubtfully what snap would we have without our villains and our enemies why the drama would have to go begging if foes became extinct well i'm charmed with the idea said betty rereading the lines i've had my eyes open to the unlovely fact that resentment a quick resentment that doesn't hang fire though it's fiery enough goodness knows is my besetting sin 
oh nonsense bet you may be resentful enough when you think of that confounded webby and nobody could blame you grumbled loyal jack you have less resentment than most people as epictetus says betty read a line from her book let me be eaten by a lion but not by a webby she ended laughing really jack i think it would be perfectly lovely to have a heart as big as the world and no room for the memory of a wrong the dramatists and jack brooks to the contrary notwithstanding oh it sounds well enough but you girls are rather transcendental there it is transcendental exclaimed betty up in arms at once just as soon as a girl mentions something that isn't clothes or tennis or cards or dancing or golf or yachting she's transcendental my oh my what a string of em take care betty you may have a spark of resentment in your big heart jack laughed good-humouredly betty joined in the laugh here's your pencil jack thank you come i'll beat you at a game of tennis and then we'll see what's in your big heart putting down her book betty snatched up a racket that lay on the steps of the side porch and ran to the court closely followed by jack while lois and dunmore followed more leisurely end of chapter four recording by holly jensen Chapter Five of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Five: Betty and the Webbies. Betty had now an occasional afternoon free. Early this morning, the mail brought a note from Mrs. King, asking her and Lois to go with them to the golf links. They would, she said, pick up Edith Banks and Gertrude Lynn on the way, and no doubt jack and dunmore would be there edwina too was invited but she decided to go with her special playmate christine stopford christine's father was an inveterate and skilful golf player and both edwina and christine felt that life would be more exciting if they tagged proudly after a real player rather than strolled under trees or drank tea on the piazza as mrs king did and as betty and lois being her guests would of course be compelled to do though to be sure they rarely left the field without playing a hole or two at least with the boys while the course was not particularly noted for its excellence yet it offered compensation to the casual player in the loveliness of the wide reach of sky and the beautiful rolling fair greens through the last of which a brook ran briskly making a hazard that was the despair of beginners and the fearful joy of the initiated mrs king and her party wandered over the fields until they came to a rustic bench perched on a hilltop that overlooked the course and was pleasantly shaded by a clump of cherry trees mrs king sank down on the bench dunny propped himself against one of the trees while jack and king threw themselves full length on the grass jack murmuring his one and unfailing quotation what so rare is a day in june at the same time keeping a watchful eye on king but the party affected a stony deafness before sitting down beside mrs king betty and lois stood a moment to take a full view of the outspreading country gertrude lynn ever mindful of her clothes sat down on a camp chair which she had asked dunny to carry from the clubhouse to protect her new spring gown from the baleful effects of the dust on a bench out in the open edith had gone off without ceremony to play with some friends they all began to talk together their tongues loosened by the fresh air and the animated scene and they were commenting admiringly on the skilful play of some club members who were driving down the green in front of them when a hush fell on the gay little party betty not knowing the cause turned to mary king and was about to speak but jack coughed significantly and remarked <clears throat> betty i see a friend of yours coming up the hill surprised by his tone betty swung round and saw mr and mrs webby walking confidently towards the group impeccable webby 
jack went on his usually kind blue eyes glaring as the little great man of the village and his youthful wife approached is it possible they have the nerve to come here after the way they treated betty said king looking at them with cold surprise i shall turn my back on them figuratively of course said mary with a disdainful shrug of her shoulders i simply can't endure snobs or bores they are both i shall escape instanter king took jack by the arm and dragged him away mrs webby greeted them effusively it was her ambition to become a member of the younger set of which mary king was the leader a second wife she was much younger than her husband mr webby had not seen betty since that evening in the library when he had urbanely commented on her enviable youth and had then proceeded to dismiss her to make room for a distant relative who had neither training nor experience and who did not need the position he now bowed to her without a trace of embarrassment the fact that he had turned betty from a position which she was filling with pronounced success was only one of the numerous selfish acts that made up his life from a boyhood of poverty to a middle age of wealth betty had determined to forget the injustice but her face now flushed with quick indignation at the memory of all the worry and anxiety this pompous little man had caused them and she bowed coolly in return to his wife's nod after nodding indifferently to mrs webby mrs king turned her eyes languidly to the horizon while lois too seemed to find distant objects more congenial mrs king with the coolness of a woman of the world could treat a pushing woman like this to a glance of amusement and a slight shrug of the shoulders and then forget her this treatment was now being accorded to immature mrs webby her husband stood talking placidly on the light and trivial subjects a man of his caliber thinks appropriate to women and was jingling his keys in his pocket the bench was large enough to hold only the three women and though betty had naturally stood up when the webbies approached she sat down again absently and turned to watch mr stopford and another club member who were passing seeing edwina and christine following them she waved her handkerchief and they threw kisses to her in return it was not long however before she discovered mary king's determination to ignore the unwelcome callers though she knew it was on her account betty could not sit comfortably while the process was going on turning to look at mary she saw that though lois was standing mrs webby evidently did not feel at liberty to occupy the vacant place without an invitation and seeing the deepening look of mortification in her eyes betty's resentment took wing as suddenly as it had come mrs webby won't you take this seat she said starting up impulsively and smiling at the embarrassed woman who hardly knew how to act in view of mrs king's evident indifference thank you miss baird said mrs webby but gazing expectantly at mary by the way bet said mary paying no attention to mrs webby we must begin our game or the sun will go down on our she paused laughing and adding in a low voice our wrath she stood up and looking at lois and including mrs webby carelessly in her glance moved towards the first tree i thought i saw mr king as i came up betty heard mr webby say as he trotted off in an effort to keep pace with mary's rapid steps in his active business as a close self-corporation he had gained an unenviable thickness of skin but his wife who had perhaps received more telling discipline in pursuit of her social aspirations could not conceal her chagrin betty walked along at mrs webby's side thinking i can't just see why she should be punished for her husband's meanness soothed by this thought she kept up a lively conversation that soon restored mrs webby's self-complacency she insisted that betty should come over to see her and remarked that she herself would drop in some day to see betty when she had nothing else to do this last gracious and naive assurance caused such a ripple of real merriment to pass over betty's face that lois wondered what the dull woman could be saying that was so humorous 
continuing mrs webby mourned her inability to learn to play golf and they do say it takes the flesh off wonderful she said regretfully her shortness of breath may be making her abbreviate her adverb so painfully bet you are going to die young whispered mary i see you'll never have much fun out of a fallen foe she added drawing betty to one side and leaving mr and mrs webby to go down the hill arm in arm i know it admitted betty at least not in cold blood betty lacked the self-complacency that makes a girl hard on the faults or deficiencies of others for she was thoroughly awake to the fact that she had plenty of her own yet she had a certain inflexible sense of justice which though offset by her warm heart and generous spirit made any lack of fair play as in mr webby's treatment of her hard to forgive the backbone of betty's character was fairness she was silent as they walked down the steep hill her mind busy with this encounter come betty girl said mary this rugged virtue of yours is making you dull come over to the clubhouse and have a cup of that which cheers but does not inebriate as they followed the path that ran around the side of a hill down to the clubhouse they came across jack who thinking mary had certainly disposed of the webbies was returning trustingly to meet them just in time to come face to face with webby why how do you do mr brooks he said urbanely and linking his arm in jack's he trudged along leaving his stout wife to follow breathless red and perspiring betty looked after her pityingly just think mary how happy that poor soul would be on their veranda fanning herself and drinking iced tea or lemonade and talking with a congenial soul it's too ridiculous said mary but with none of betty's pity she comes here to be in the swim not because she cares for golf why doesn't she do what she cares for in one corner of the broad veranda of the picturesque clubhouse now crowded with members and their friends they found edith cosily drinking lemonade with lois gertrude and dunny who had managed to reach it by a roundabout route below them on the well-rolled croquet ground they could see edwina and christine engrossed in a game while on the clay tennis courts the club experts were engaged in a hotly contested match encouraged by the applause of the spectators who lined the sides of the courts jack soon joined the party he had suffered the familiarity of the man he detested not a moment longer than courtesy demanded from a younger to an older man his loyalty to betty turned his carelessly good-natured treatment of people in general and bores in particular into an attitude of dignified reserve in this case end of chapter five recording by holly jensen chapter six of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter six betty's golden minute late the same afternoon while lois was writing to her father betty waited for her cosily curled up in her window seat book in hand and alternately read and watched edwina's roller skate cavortings on the flag walk just under her window mrs baird stopped as she passed the open door why betty she exclaimed reproachfully look at your room your hat not put away your coat on the bed and your hair betty scrambled to her feet and drew her mother in now mother darling just you sit on that comfortable seat while i explain i washed my hair this morning so i let everything else go mrs baird looked puzzled haven't you time she stopped at a loss oh yes plenty of time answered betty nonchalantly her eyes were full of mirth as she glanced around the room with the papers books and coat and hat scattered about on tables and chairs but mother i just can't keep my hair up the pins are always dropping out and somehow when my hair acts that way it takes away all my sense of responsibility it doesn't seem to make any difference whether school keeps or not ended betty as if clenching a brilliant and convincing syllogism mrs baird laughed 
in that case betty i'll put a little brilliantine on your brush and restore your normal moral sense at least until you put away your hat and that freshly laundered shirt-waist i suppose the other things are merely artistic disarray twas ever thus sighed betty dramatically clasping her flying hair in her two hands and inserting more hairpins comes of having puritan ancestors can't be shiftless for a single moment however the hat was thrust into its box and put away on the top shelf of the closet the coat was on its hanger in a trice and betty sat down by her mother and pointed out edwina's new accomplishment one of the farmer's children had joined her and they were having a keen competition with one skate apiece in spite of betty's airy disavowal of moral responsibility she had been thinking deeply and perhaps perplexedly about her encounter with mr webby for a time there was silence then betty slipped her hand into her mother's and spoke hesitatingly mother what is it dear she turned around expectantly she knew that betty had something on her mind when she began with that almost reluctant tone of questioning i saw i talked with the the webbies to-day yes mrs baird leaned forward then betty told her mother about her afternoon's experience i'm glad this has happened sweetheart said mrs baird i couldn't bear to think there was any one in the world you couldn't think kindly about you feel better about them now don't you betty played with her mother's ring smiling and shaking her head slowly i didn't have a word to say to mr webby and i don't know that i feel a bit better about him and his old library but i did pity her and i just thought why should she suffer for what her husband did she wasn't to blame for it it's the easiest thing in the world to vent our wrath on anybody connected with one who has injured us i wasn't sure that even mr webby's cat would be safe from you said mrs baird playfully then more seriously betty darling you must do your best to stamp out resentment if left to rankle there is almost nothing else that will hurt a fine nature so quickly and there's only one way to destroy it to love your neighbor as yourself otherwise there is no peace in the heart it seems to the young yes and to the old too a deep and hard philosophy but only love can make life broad and livable that's the reason we have the second part of the summary of the law betty shook her head rebelliously and started up i don't see how you can compel love and for such people as the webbies just think how unjust mr webby was to me putting me out of that position you don't need to compel it said her mother smiling at betty's hearty and natural distaste for the idea of trying to love the webbies it will compel you if every time you remember an injustice you try to think of some kind thing about the one who has done it and when possible do something for that person betty gave an incredulous whistle oh mother think something kind of mr webby betty was not the first to find that a hard saying mrs baird smiled at her daughter's vehemence sweetheart are you happy in your work with miss minturne she asked abruptly betty turned to her mother rather wonderingly why mother what a question you know i am perfectly happy i think it's wonderful the way it came about mrs baird's gentle eyes twinkled at the success of her little trap betty dear she asked didn't mr webby have something to do with bringing it all about betty looked at her mother suspiciously then a ripple broke over her face and she laughed appreciatively mother darling score one for you the joke's on me yes i'll have to give mr webby some of the credit though honestly i do it grudgingly the effort will be mechanical at first but not insincere mrs baird paused as if trying to recall something then with an amused smile she continued betty don't you remember that little book of your grandmother seabury's the poor rich man and the rich poor man you used to read it when you could barely spell out the words why of course i do betty ran to the bookcase 
i can put my hand on it in the dark it's on the top shelf with her fenelon's pious thoughts and young's night thoughts she took down the slender faded green book on whose narrow frayed back was the title in plain gold letters and opened it gaily at the first page and read to miss elizabeth seabury from her friend joseph lyman january first eighteen thirty betty laughed isn't that quaint to miss elizabeth seabury when grandmother was only six and isn't the writing beautifully plain and literary looking betty looked intently at the old-fashioned writing then turned over the leaves quickly but what made you speak of this she asked as her mother took the book don't you see betty that mr webby is the poor rich man now can't you give him the same consideration that you do our farmer john here just because he's poor and has a delicate wife we overlook a great many of his shortcomings but that seems different somehow said betty smiling as though she did see but was not willing to acknowledge it when it came to the pompous mr webby poor people have such hard times harry's been given a book as a prize by his schoolmaster and this is what he finds on the blank page as he shows it to his two girl friends mrs baird then read in her pleasant cultivated voice it gives me much pleasure to record here the diligence and success of my esteemed pupil harry aiken and still more to testify to his strict practice of the golden rule of this book do unto others as ye would they should do unto you oh i remember mother the girls were discussing it and little susie said this prize was for loving everybody here it is but i remember i loved harry because he said he didn't love everybody by a seaful now we'd say jugful then they proved he couldn't follow the golden rule without loving people that's what i wanted to find and mrs baird took the book again and turned over the pages he said his mother told him just to do a person a kindness to set about to make him happier and the love or something that would answer the purpose would be pretty sure to come i used to love that little book said betty she hesitated for she knew how her mother prized all keepsakes of her own mother's i love it now for it's so quaint betty patted the little volume but mother isn't it a trifle sunday schoolish you might do worse as miss jane says than to read some of these sunday schoolish books mrs baird laughed if you live up to the golden rule you won't find it a goody goody living i assure you she added emphatically it takes pluck and plenty of it you know who inspired the words the bravest life ever lived finished mrs baird softly as betty sat down and leaned against her knee to keep the golden rule would make a golden life wouldn't it mother mine said betty abruptly playing absently with the book yes said her mother one might begin with a golden year then accumulate gold for a lifetime i'd rather try for a golden day first no a golden minute would be safer betty laughed i might possibly have a golden minute why not begin our gold hoarding this golden minute said mrs baird she took the little book and wrote lightly on the fly-leaf april thirtieth betty baird her golden year she looked at it thoughtfully for a moment then added this line from an early american poet pour blessings round thee like a shower of gold betty leaned over to watch her writing oh mother she cried catching her breath as the last word was put down it's like like taking a pledge she rose to her feet and stood over her mother kissing her hair and whispering i'll try mother dearest then shooting a mischievous glance backwards as she ran from the room she called over her shoulder but it would have been nice to stay at home with you in the silver lining library end of chapter six recording by holly jensen Chapter Seven of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Seven: Nods and Becks and Wreathed Smiles. 
john was the farmer on shares of the century-old farm which the bairds had bought and which betty had named boxwood because of the thick old box that wound plumply up to the front and side doors and encircled the few remaining flower beds he was a queer taciturn glum creature his only recreation foretelling the weather at almost any hour of the day one could see his lean neck twisted towards the sky and his jaw and mouth which occupied half his long face tilted to a strange angle of observation on this may day betty found him planted at the front gate in his prophetic attitude now do please say that it will be a splendid bright day betty besought him she gazed anxiously towards the southwest where a few clouds had piled up since she looked out of her window early in the morning don't know as i can truthful john growled he did not like to be disturbed at this ticklish business betty's heart sank she had great faith in his powers as he had been a sailor in his youth and had spent much of his time scanning the sky yet hope did not die for at best john was not a cheerful herald of the day his prophecies were jeremiads too often to be wholly trustworthy then too poor john had dyspepsy look at them clouds raisin from the lee agin the wind like birds raisin from the water it certainly looks to me as if we'd have fallen weather about high tide he went on with growing hope and high tide at three seventeen to-day betty was dismayed now just think how disappointed your little girls will be if it rains she cajoled him trying to soften his prognostications by an appeal to the one well-known tender spot in his heart john squinted at the sky once more then looked towards his house where his two tow-headed children were racing around and flapping their blue gingham aprons at the chickens scratching in the garden them clouds might maybe lighten up a leetle mite towards noon he granted he was plunged in thought for a moment still a wet may brings a barn full of hay if it rains we oughter recollect that he said gleefully he walked off with the air of a man at peace with his conscience and the whole world betty was rooted to the spot well of all detestable people she began then a humorous smile dimpled the corners of her mouth and she ran into breakfast to set the family off with john the joy killer's latest bit of constitutional saturninity but john's prophecy did not bring its own fulfilment sweetness and warmth through the air exquisite mingling of yellow greens in the foliage of the arching elms against the background of dark firs a blue sky with swarming clouds of fleece deep shadows on the bay from the low wooded hills all gave to betty's home this may day an elusive charm found in a mezzotint after gainsborough jack and dunny came early to hang ribbons of contrasting colors from the top of the maypole which were to be woven by the children in their dance mr king brought a splendid curtain of crimson and gold to throw over lois's throne while jack's mother sent a load of decorative shrubs of course lois knew that the children were to welcome her and entered gaily into the play there was to be as little formality as possible she said in the part she was to take in the ceremony for the dainty maids with their joyous songs and sweet-smelling garlands would make the queen's part subordinate so she threw aside all self-consciousness and lost herself in the jolly spirit of the day john made hay while the sun shone since his thunderclouds had gone back on him by cutting the new grass and clipping the old box into symmetrical trimness chairs and tables tottering always a little downhill stood under the trees giving a sense of merrymaking that was inspired partly by their festive air of irresponsibility as safe places for body and limb for dishes or food the snowy damask the great bowls of jonquils and dogwood and the blue dishes added their touch of romance to this picture filched from the picturesque days of merry old england craig ellsworth came early bringing his mother and dotty aged five in his boat betty and craig had been good comrades ever since the bairds had moved to long island as craig was her nearest neighbor 
they had swapped talents betty helping the lad with his latin while he taught her scientific gardening craig had his own way to make in the world and was quite unaccustomed to society until he fell in with betty and her friends then he went to college and at once a transformation began he was passing through the dandy period and betty changed her name for him from clamor boy to arbiter elegantium he had gained to perfection what he called savoir faire somewhat laughingly it's true but with more seriousness than jack or dunny to whom society was an old story would attach to the phrase betty often wondered which way the scales would turn and held her breath to-day when she saw him carrying a slim walking-stick dr and mrs baird with mrs brooks and mary king and others received the guests informally under the cedars lois was not dressed in conventional may queen style for she wanted to join in the games so the only touch of regality was a gold filigree belt on her simple white china silk in which she tucked the violets dunmore lane had brought her betty's creamy flannel suit was to use gertrude's word about it and gertrude was an authority on clothes chic and no one could doubt its becomingness lois had stuck a rose into her golden wavy hair and the succession of expressions on her face one moment blithe then anxious again dimpling with fun showing concern for some guest's comfort smiling whimsically at one of john's characteristic actions or brimming over with the joke jack had told her all evinced a personality of sweetness of humor of sunniness of generous high spirits that made things go and made her loved mrs ellsworth when shaking hands with her whispered you are craig's guiding star and for the moment since the air was so clear and sweet and the sun so bright and the world so happy betty thrilled at the words a guiding star but her sense of humor was too much for her and as she looked at craig's jaunty little cane she knew she didn't want to be his star involuntarily her eyes sought jack handsome debonair jack brooks rich well-bred a prince of good fellows then her hand was clutched and she heard edwina's elegant announcement of the arrival of bishop wayborn and his two grandsons paul and reginald all swarmed around the bishop for though a high dignitary there was so much simplicity and sweetness in his nature that children loved to catch his hand and had a sense of peculiar nearness to the tall distinguished-looking clergyman reginald seized betty's hands in both of his while paul greeted her not less warmly but with more dignity as became an older brother and a theological student betty spoke to paul with some shyness though she admired him she did not feel easy with him she felt that her gay temperament was displeasing to him and betty had always wanted to please paul though why she could not have explained even to herself and certainly not to lois perhaps charles lamb sad misnomer made the sensation of the early arrivals a classmate of dunmore lane's he was a true satellite tolerated for the really good heart which shone through his harmless eccentricities the count as they had dubbed him at yale appeared to-day in all the glory of yellow waistcoat yellow buckskin gloves yellow spats shining top hat and a huge horsehead walking stick with his bulldog at his heels clever handsome edith banks with a touch of airiness befitting a may-day party in her white billowy hat was there the very one for reginald betty and lois decided while gertrude lynn in her trailing gray directoire gown beamed on lamb whom jack at once piloted up to her the others as king called the guests who were not in the intimate inner circle came swiftly in carriages automobiles or boats in true holiday spirits end of chapter seven Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Eight of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
recording by holly jensen chapter eight the may day games i i been a rambling all this night and some time of this day and now returning back again i brought you a garland gay a garland gay i brought you here and at your door i stand tis nothing but a sprout but tis well budded out the works of our lord's hand the ancient may-day carol rang out full and clear and sweet from the thicket of lilacs as nine little maids singing blithely and swinging their garlands gay like dryads from their native oaks came dancing across the greensward to lois on her throne dotty herself a dimpled sunny flower with a lightly woven basket of posies on her head the tendrils rippling down among her curls tripped ahead lisping the song then hand in hand and two by two danced edwina and christine phyllis and priscilla henrietta and mary virginia and mary bell all in white with fluttering sashes of violet blue or pink dancing and singing in unison they flung their fragrant rosy wreaths to the breeze and like a lovely rainbow they formed in front of lois singing the carol again and chanting with saucy smiles the cheery refrain why don't you do as we have done the very first of may they bent one knee before their queen and showered the sweet-smelling arbutus upon her again they bent the knee and moving backwards curtsied low at every third step as they gaily repeated with laughing eyes on their queen the elfishly mocking refrain as farther and farther they danced away to the maypole why don't you do as we have done the very first of may why yes why don't we cried betty springing up lois you and dunny first off over the green danced the queen and dunny lane jack grasped betty's hand and they whirled merrily after them alexander king and mary flew close behind craig and edith clasped hands and went skipping away reginald followed briskly with dorothy king paul snatched up one of john's little girls and danced away charlie lamb and gertrude came on behind john and his wife hand in hand trudged grimly after the bishop followed in a dignified minuet step with mrs baird as the doctor and mrs brooks stepped lightly off no one failed in this happy surrender to the tempting invitation of the lovely sprites and the spring day was filled with voices chanting merrily why don't you do as we have done the very first of may across the soft grass the feet of young and old danced a royal welcome to the may day and the children caught the swaying ribbons and wove them swiftly about the maypole may i put this piece of may in your buttonhole asked christine of the bishop i shall be delighted my dear the bishop leaned down benignly so her timid fingers could place the blossom on his coat it seems all a piece of may he added straightening up and looking around then noticing dr and mrs baird and mrs brooks coming up he sportively challenged them to a game of croquet others started bowling on the green which craig explained in his terse precise way the children skipped off to play a brisk game of battledore and shuttlecock then there was a call for the most exciting feature of the afternoon the archery contest jack an enthusiastic and skilful archer now appeared weighed down with bows and arrows which he dropped on a chair his younger brother rodney tagged proudly after him lugging the target jack had greatly interested betty and lois and to some extent edith and gertrude in the game and had given them a good deal of instruction now after he had placed the target near the stone fence he turned to them ladies first he bowed waving his hand towards the weapons and let your arrows stick in the target you are not going to make us shoot first protested the girls we won't shoot first they locked their hands behind them the boys surrounded them and insisted but they stood fast suddenly betty sprang forward and seized a bow and arrow i suppose you want us to shoot first jack brooks so you can notch our arrows for us she mocked gaily 
very well jolly knight the games must go on so i'll give you the chance aha uh -huh, old man they see through your little game all right laughed dunny digging his elbows into jack's ribs in return jack gave a huge knowing wink as betty got ready to shoot poising her graceful young figure with the left foot advanced she raised her bow drew her right hand steadily back to her ear fastened her eye on the target and let fly nine instantly called out craig who stood down at the target hooray bully for betty cheered the boys tossing their caps into the air while the girls clapped triumphantly the bowlers croquet players and the children with their battle doors and shuttlecocks hearing the uproar rushed in a body to the course lined up on each side and craned their necks eagerly to see the target seeing betty's arrow sticking almost exactly in the centre of the bull's-eye they burst into a round of applause oh girls screamed edwina shrilly waving her battledore wildly to the slow ones as she pranced around her black eyes snapping oh girls cousin betty hit the bull right in the eye little rodney brooks sniffed scornfully at edwina's bragging and glowered darkly at her huh, accidents will happen the other girls then displayed their skill all shooting carefully and with varying degrees of success but all doing pretty well at last when the boy's turn came the target looked like the twin brother to a porcupine be sure you notch the arrow in the bull's eye dunny warned jack with a smile at betty as jack stepped up to shoot drive it clear through the target jack called out king don't let those girls beat you pleaded rodney turning his back on edwina with a great show of care jack picked out a bow tested it twanged the string and examined it carefully for fraying picked up one arrow after another and sighted along each until perfectly satisfied that he had a straight one held up a blade of grass to test the force and direction of the wind planted himself firmly on his feet raised his bow aimed long and carefully shot and missed his arrow plumped into the old stone wall and flew into a dozen pieces the spectators gazed in surprise for a second then set up for a shout of laughter and the little girls facing the downcast rodney exulted at the top of their voices he missed he missed betty beat him ha 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 dunny king craig reginald and paul surrounded jack and hilariously wished him better luck next time he tried hard to look chagrined when he finally freed himself from the boys and walked over to where the girls were standing in a group watching the proceedings with suspicious eyes i certainly did my best there must have been something wrong with the feathering of that arrow he explained speciously jack you're a perfect humbug you did your level best to miss it said betty now dunny it's your turn do play fair won't you of course betty of course dunny assured her earnestly jack suppressed a snicker and the other boys with averted faces hurried out of earshot dunny's preparations for his shot were if possible more painstaking than jack's but his arrow landed on the very edge of the target and hung dangling there he looked at it with a pained expression great scott jack he ejaculated you and i'd better give up archery and go back to marbles and mumbledy peg we can't shoot for sour apples you're certainly a rank shot old fellow one of the worst ever jack agreed cheerfully slapping him on the shoulder beat you anyhow retorted dunny in the end betty was tumultuously proclaimed victor with lois a close second and they were showered with congratulations by the boys who professed breathless admiration at their marvellous skill all the younger folks stayed for the dance in the barn in the evening it was a fine substantial building made of heavy timbers with the conscientious workmanship of a hundred years ago it had been cleaned until it shone and the boys took great delight in hanging from the massive beams ship's lanterns and quaint old household ones long out of use and ranging picturesquely on a high shelf pots of flowers and shrubs 
and festooning the walls with flags and bunting the great wide doors were flung open and the crescent moon came out over the little hills and shone full into the deep barn as the merrymakers strolled in two by two the floor was excellent for dancing and bundles of sweet yellow hay around the walls formed seats for the onlookers and for those weary of tripping the light fantastic toe the village fiddler sat on a barrel in a corner under the light of a great brass ship's lantern and struck up wild rollicking airs money musk and the sailor's hornpipe being the favorites soon there was a call for a waltz tune and waltzes polkas and square dances followed in rapid succession until all were thoroughly tired the fiddler leaned back against the wall his ancient fiddle across his knee and the dancers dropped on the bundles of hay to rest while betty and lois dipped out old katie's delicious fruit lemonade all at once they were startled by a weird sound looking up they saw dancing down the middle of the barn floor a mad-looking creature making mad music what betty started to ask when the queer fantastic object drew near why it's a highlander in his kilts and oh lois he's playing a bagpipe a second figure similarly dressed flung itself after the first and the two wild scots danced a highland fling in the centre of the floor their claymores and dirks gleaming fearfully and then with frantic gestures and a last wild note from the pipes the two disappeared as mysteriously as they had come and went to their quiet gardener's lodges on the brooks estate end of chapter eight recording by holly jensen chapter nine of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 9. Just as Lois had said. Betty was at her desk, figuring busily on a set of specifications, some particularly naughty problems bringing passing frowns to her forehead, when Miss Minturn, tall, graceful, distinguished, with decision written on every handsome feature, swept through the room and stopped in front of the desk she began to play with a book picking it up laying it down only to go through the process again won't you have my swivel chair miss minturn betty sprang up and pushed it forward for it was one of their jokes that nothing in the world but a revolving chair could give them a sense of business prosperity each offered her own to the other as a mark of very special favor no thank you betty replied miss minturn absently too much in earnest to notice the little by-play i'm going to run away to-morrow do you think your mother would let you run with me betty caught her breath it was just as lois had said i can ask her to-night and telephone to you i'd love to run away with you and i'm sure my mother would let me why not ask your father at luncheon betty laughed in her happy infectious manner i could but father would be certain to say ask your mother elizabeth and when i ask mother she will say ask your father elizabeth and there i shall be elizabeth from one to the other like a weaver's shuttle until at last they go to the study to talk it over and presently i shall hear the outcome miss minturn smiled lovingly into betty's bright laughing face i didn't know you were such a weighty subject well telephone to me you should go home right after lunch and get your things together naturally betty was dying to ask where they were going but with the courtesy that was instinctive she waited for miss minturn to volunteer the information shall i take a trunk oh no only a small bag that blue serge you have on will be just the thing for travelling and a dinner gown and your pretty white flannel will be enough if my mother should want to write to me where what address shall i give her that's so you dear old homebody of course your mother'll want to know miss minturn thought a moment really betty i haven't decided i need a change and i'm going to run around until i find it i'll explain to your father tomorrow morning i suppose then on the wing will be the best address betty laughed 
promptly at eight o'clock the next morning dr baird and betty carrying her bag and umbrella met miss minturne at the thirty-fourth street ferry the doctor and miss minturne shook hands cordially it's very good of you dr baird to let me have betty i promise to take the best care of her during the past year we have had abundant proof of your ability to do that miss minturne the doctor bowed you are very kind doctor but really betty has been taking care of me instead of i of her you don't know what a comfort and help that dear girl has been to me turning her eyes to betty who had wandered off to the newsstand and was vainly trying to decide on a magazine from among the fascinating and bewildering array elizabeth has been very happy with you said the doctor rather helpless in conventional conversation his life had been unusually free from the amenities of society pure and simple in weston his conversation during his pastoral calls had always had the sustaining basis of church matters in which every one was interested momentarily at least but allow me to purchase your ticket he added as the happy thought occurred to him he drew his long wallet from the inside pocket of his waistcoat thank you very much but i have a mileage book and besides i-well really dr baird i haven't determined where we are going i have such perfect confidence in betty that i've been thinking of letting her decide miss minturne showed what was rather unusual with her some embarrassment would you object if we should get on the first train that's ready and get out when we feel like it betty can settle it when the conductor comes around we'll stay on long island so we won't be far away we'll telephone or telegraph as soon as we arrive at utopia supplied the doctor never fear father said betty who had just come up miss minturne always lands somewhere and if she leaves it to me i'll land her miss minturne listened smiling for they always appreciated each other's little jokes then she turned to the doctor to tell the truth i want to get away from thinking so it positively hurts to try to decide where to go i thought about it nearly all night and i hated every spot the moment it came to my mind ah said the doctor earnestly i fear miss minturne you are sadly in need of rest that state denotes a high nervous tension i remember how sleepless i grew in trying to decide about coming to new york he was interrupted by the announcement that the train was ready kissing betty and shaking hands with miss minturne he watched them go off betty's face full of interest and mischief over the mysterious journey what a relief to be going going from that big noisy city exclaimed miss minturne as she sank back into the seat drawing a long sigh leaning back she closed her eyes and was silent betty's eyes were very tender as she tried to make miss minturne more comfortable she slid her bag under her feet and pulled down the shade to protect her from the sun hearing the car door slam she looked up and saw the conductor working his way slowly towards them she glanced at miss minturne who still lay back not an eyelid moving the conductor drew near betty looked at him then back at miss minturne and at the mileage book in her hand the conductor was now taking a ticket from the bronzed farmer across the aisle here he is still miss minturne gave no sign hastily but gently betty took the book from her hand a smile came to miss minturne's lips but she did not open her eyes betty thought rapidly then she named a station she knew not many miles from her home where she had driven with mrs brooks and jack and where they had found a delightful inn situated picturesquely by the sound the conductor tore the necessary mileage slips from the books and passed on miss minturne opened her eyes thank you child she said reaching over and patting betty's hand betty took her hand and held it in her firm loving grasp yet she smiled to herself lois was certainly right i didn't know it took people this way the poets don't speak of a case like this still it must be hard for her to think of giving up all that beautiful work she is so much interested in for of course mr anstice won't let her go on with her studio of design to eighteen-year-old betty staid gray-haired mr anstice naturally didn't weigh very heavily against the fascinating art 
not a word was spoken until they came to the end of their journey the station was spick and span surrounded by plots of fresh grass and beds of early spring flowers leaving the car they stepped into a decrepit hack drawn by a pair of lean gray horses the driver an old white-whiskered man whose mahogany complexion and gnarled hands showed that a life of toil had preceded this leisurely occupation drove them slowly to the inn after dinner as they sat by the water miss minturne said suddenly we shall leave here to-morrow it's too soothing i need a counter irritant i am going to see my grand aunt in westchester she lives on our old homestead minturne manor you'll like it betty for it's more than a hundred and fifty years old don't you need rest miss minturne rather than a counter irritant you've worked hard all winter and now you feel it you are right dear i am fagged out by the way betty have you ever noticed that our friends you are doing it now excuse our unevenness and irritability by saying that we are tired well i like uneven people protested betty loyally you are young enough to bear it little sister but as we grow older we won't put up with it we don't like people who take things hard it's taking too much of a liberty with our own peace and comfort your quotation from newman is right a cheerful heart an even temper sweetness gentleness and brightness of mind are worth everything End of chapter 9 Recording by Holly Jensen